Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to lecture seven. Today we're gonna cover token classification and retrieval. So let's start with quiz as always. So I'm gonna create a poll. Zero seven. Okay, sorry, I had to create these options. Right, looks, I think they're right. Okay, three minutes.
Okay, so looks like these were not easy questions. Let's come back to these after recapping our lecture six. Okay, so before that, um, announcements. So please make sure to put your student ID and name on your Zoom profile because this is used to record your attendance. And of course, if we cannot find you, then we cannot give you attendance credit, right? So please make sure to make it identifiable and also consistent if possible so that we don't have troubles. And also assignment one is due at 11 p.m. this Wednesday. So please start early. If you are not familiar with PyTorch, you will, it will take a lot of time for you to get used to it. So be aware of that. Oh, and yeah, I think Mion just, our head TA just mentioned that some of the uh, missing names there are. So please chat with her to make sure you're in the attendance list. Okay, so let's go with the recap. All right, so first of all, so I think it's been actually two weeks, right? So we had a pretty long break over the uh, sock. So I hope you recall, recall that. So we first, in the recurrent relationship of LSTM, we use the same input <coughs> for computing the gates. So, I, oh, oh, okay. So we use xt, same xt, right? And same ht minus one, but we use different, same size, but different weights to compute each gate and the memory state, right? So one thing to really note is that, well, if we want to compute this efficiently, then it's possible to concatenate all these weights so that, in fact, we can say, these can be all computed at all, all at once before applying the the well, I'll just call this uh, apostrophe because we are we haven't applied the the sigmoid or tangent the nonlinearity. Then this will be simply just concatenating raw wise and then multiply the same xt plus we do the same thing right. Of course, we have to apply the sigmoid for the gates. So the sig sigma g is sigmoid. And sigma c can be considered as 10h, typically. So then f will be just a, sig a sigmoid of uh, f prime, and etc. And the c tilde will be tangent h of uh, c tilde prime. And after computing all these, then, then you can apply, you can do the element-wise multiplication. So I think I haven't told you, but this is element-wise multiplication. Okay. So, and then one thing to note is that these gates, because of using sigmoid, they will be valued between zero and one. And that's why they are called gates. It's basically deciding how much you pass. And one interesting aspect of LSTM is that the gate doesn't necessarily mean that if you forget something at certain dimensions of the memory state, the C, C's memory state, doesn't mean that you will actually, so even if the F is pretty high, doesn't mean that I will be low at that point. So it, it so the important thing here is that, F plus I is not equal to 1.0 of vector. 
a vector of 1.0. Note that this is actually the case in many other gate, 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 gate based mechanisms because in that case, then you use gate to actually decide which dimension you use the previous hidden state and which dimension you use the current input or current the memory state candidate. Okay. And the recurrent relationship is defined at the memory state level and hidden state is a function of the memory state and the output gate. Well, so you might wonder why you're using C instead of H, not the other way. Well, because there is a convention that hidden state is usually used to indicate the output of the recurrent neural network. And we are using H for the output of the LSTM, not the CT. But at the end, it doesn't really matter much. And we talked about the bi-directional RNNs. So, well, the limitation of a unidirectional RNN is that you can only have dependency on tokens that happen before you or the current time step. So what if you want to look at the uh, tokens that happened after the current token? Because in many cases, when you're trying to understand a sentence, the words that come after you, the current time step will be helpful. So why not do bidirectional? Then there are two RNNs in both directions. And if you want to do classification and token level, then you should concatenate their outputs each time step. If you want to do something on the text level, for instance, text level, text classification, you concatenate the last output of the forward and the first output of uh, backwards. So in that case, then, you use this and there will be also backward and you use that. And then you concatenate these two for the final output. That's typical way of approaching this problem. And it's also natural to concast, uh, uh, stack several layers. And when you're stacking layers, it's usually the case that you will not use the same uh, parameters. The parameters will not be shared across the layers. Note that the parameters are actually shared across the times, time, time, uh, time axis because otherwise you cannot account for arbitrary length of inputs, but then you do not actually share across the layers. And in many cases in, in modern uh, neural networks, when you're stacking layers, it's very common to use residual connection, which just means that the output of the second layer is the output of I mean, uh, the final output of second layer is the uh, output of the second layer plus the first layer's output. It's called residual. And we talk about dropout, and we we actually told you that when you're dropping, uh, you 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 have you usually define dropout with the probability of dropping, not keeping. I mean, it depends on the actually your um, like architecture. Sometimes you actually define keep probability. In that case, then if your dropout probability is 0.2, then your keep probability will be 0.8. So please note that. Please make sure which 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 way you're actually defining your p. Is. And usually p usually ranges from 0.1 to 0.5, which means the keep probability will range from 0.9 to 0.5. And important thing is that during inference, you do not apply dropout. So which means then during training time, your output will be statistically lower, right? Because you drop something. So that which means there will be some bias. So in order to incorporate or basically scale back, account for that bias, we upscale the outputs by one over one minus P. So if P is 0.2, then we upscale that by one over 0 0.8, which is five over five over four. We multiply that to the, the, the training of the, the, the vector in during training time, of course, but after dropout. So multiplying zero to five over four will be still be zero, but other values will be upscaled by that much. And it's a very effective regularization method that can be considered as an ensemble of multiple models. And also we discussed pooling, which is basically an alternative to using RNN's last time step for the output. So we talked about when we're doing the text classification, we 
the natural choice is to use the last time steps output. Or if you're using bidirectional RNs, then first time step for the backward and the last time step for the forward. But then this means that information has to go through a lot of layers and has no shortcut. And in general, it's good to make a shortcut. That's actually one of the really important lessons that we have learned as a community for a few years since deep learning has emerged. So shortcut, one example is residual. We just talked about a few slides ago. Another way to create a shortcut is pooling, which is just basically getting the uh, using the outputs from every time step and then just average them or take a mean or max to actually create the last output, final output directly from the all the RNN outputs. That, that way you will always have shortcut from all the inputs. You don't have to go through so many layers to get to your input or, and this will be very helpful when you're computing gradients. So we discussed that basically this concludes our um, sentiment classification, text classification, and model-wise RNNs and learning-wise, we'll be sticking to vanilla for a few weeks, but I hope you get the point. What I mean by um, task and formulation, these two are different. The formulation is how you approach the task, but task is actual task that you, how you define the input and output. It can be thought as a, more of a deliverable if you're actually creating some application or service. And then you basically formulate that into text classification. It's also possible that you can formulate sentiment classification into um, text generation model too. It's just that people don't do that because it only adds more complexity. I was trying to make difference. Uh, I was trying to emphasize difference between task and formulation. And model, I think, is pretty straightforward. Okay. And we talk about token classification briefly. So. We, we said that the token classification is also known as sequence tagging. And in text classification, you classify the entire text into categories, but in token classification, you classify each token of the text. And natural question then is, why do you want to do that? And number two is, how do you do it? So why you want to do it is quite obvious actually, because in many NLP tasks, you want to classify each token. For instance, part of speech tagging is telling whether each word is a verb, determiner, noun, phrase, et cetera. Apparently we have to actually classify each token, not the entire text. And there's also a test called named entity recognition that tries to find named entities, names, places, countries, organizations, locations, et cetera. And how we approach this problem is that we basically try to define where each entity begins and ends, which we'll actually we'll start our lecture with today. So coming back to the quiz. So I'll now start the quiz. Hopefully there was enough time for you to take the quiz and the poll. I'm going to um, save it. Just one second. All right, so I'm sharing the results. Let's take a look. Okay, first question. True or false? LSTM forget and input gates are defined such that their dimension y sum is always equal to 1.0. So I just told you that LSTM input and forget gates actually are defined independently. So it's not guaranteed that they will, their sum will be 1.0. It's possible that you actually pass, pass through both previous hidden state and current memory state candidate, although this could have been confusing because some RNNs actually use uh, gates that always sum to 1.0. So this is false. And number two, I think this was probably the hardest question um, up to like, I think not just this quiz, but the, every, uh, the entire quiz we took this semester. So suppose that you apply dropout at the input of each layer with the probability of 0.2. Also, so P equal 1.2, right? 
And then you're saying that there's a output of first layer is four, negative one and two. And then after sampling, if only the second, sampling means here, of course, dropped out sampling. Only the second dimension of the vector is dropped, then that means this is gone. Then what is the input to the scan second layer during training time? So actually the important thing is that after you apply a dropout, this will be four, zero, two, but we're not done yet because we have to scale up. So this becomes, you have to actually multiply that by one over one minus P, which is one over what? 0 0.8, which is five over four. So if you multiply five over four to four, then this becomes five, zero is still zero, and two becomes 2.5. So the answer is five comma zero comma 2.5. Okay, so the question was, is the scaling up during inference time? No, so, well, it really depends on your implementation actually, but um, at least in PyTorch, it's happening during training time. So if the scaling up happens during inference time, then 402 can be a correct answer. But then in that case, the, <clears throat> the issue is, that's not a good thing because if you change, then in that case, you will your model is always tied to the dropout probability, right? During inference time. So if you actually inference model with dropout 0.3, if you change your hyperparameter, then your output will be different. So that'll be very bad, right? So um, of course, depending on the model architecture, it might not affect anything, but at least it changed numbers. So we do that usually in training time to avoid that. But then the effect will be actually uh, usually the same though. Very similar. Number three, suppose you have a sequence length of 16 and the RNA output of each token is 64. If you perform mean pulling over the sequence length, what is the size of the result of the pulling? So this is more, more of a, um, I think quite straightforward question, but the options could have been confusing. The answer is 64 because pulling is happening over the sequence length. So that is the dimension that gets Get rid, got get getting rid of. So basically, it gets squeezed into one. But what remains is the output dimension, which is sixty four. Okay, I think quite clear. All right, so that's great. All right, so let's get into today's lecture. All right, so let's, let's begin with the bio, uh, bio tagging or IOB tagging. So what this is about is that we want to label each token with one of either beginning, intermediate, or others. And sometimes people call it IOB because they start with I, I don't know why. But so why do we want to do bio tagging? And you might wonder, why can't we just have two tags, right? Just B and O maybe, right? Because what really matters is whether we want to use that token for the information or not. And the reason why is that we need I because sometimes two entities can be back to back. So I think this example was probably not the good, good example, but for instance, um, so suppose that this was something like Barack Obama was it's a bit weird wording, but USA president, which is not entirely wrong way to say it, right? But then we want to make sure that USA and president are separate thing, right? So if we want to extract both, then if we just label both as B and, okay, not bad, not bad, not USA. So United States president, but we want to make sure we split here. Then if we just actually put everything B, it's not clear where the boundary between two entities is. But then by having I, which means intermediate, which just means that it's not beginning, but still in the, we have to, it's still within the entity. Then we can just cut here 
every time we see a B, we actually start, we cut whatever we had up to then and then start a new entity. So having I allows us to have a uh, extract entities that are actually, you know, together or uh, basically back to back there, uh, you know, next to each other. That's what I mean here that uh, it allows us to um, extract multiple spans. And so in that case, then what will be the entity now, what will, be, what will be the labels for this example? Well, it depends on what you want to extract. Biotagging is just for extracting spans, but usually it's used for named entities and named entity means person, location, or country. In that case, then Barak will be B, but not just B, but B of person. So there's, there isn't only one B, but there are several Bs. So it's not actually three-way classification because if we have a person location and um, country, then it will be, we will have three kinds of B. We also need three kinds of I. We only have one O. So what does that mean? If we have a three kinds of classes of spans, then the number of a token classification is, number of token classes is actually um, three, two times number of uh, the, the, uh, the span classes plus one, right? Because we have to account for B and I for each class and o, a one for O, right? It's simple math. So then in that case, then Barack will be labeled with B of person. Obama will be I, an intermediate person. Was will be nothing. Bell will be nothing. Um, president, actually, um, I was trying to show you an example, but this will be also not an entity. O is also not an entity. The is not the entity, but the United States actually is an entity country, right? So it will be B of a, co a country and the states will be I. And if we have a good to uh, the tokenizer, then we will have a separate token for period and this will be O. So that's, that will be our objective of tokens classification if you were doing biotagging for named entity recognition. And then, now, where the important question is, how can we design a model for this? And fortunately, designing a model after we have done text classification is not super um, difficult because we still have same same input, which is tokenized sentence, just like sentiment classification. And our output will be token level three way probability distribution if we have only one kind of span. Of course, this will be seven if we have a person, location, and country. Wait, I think it was location and country. Wait, what was it? My bad. Yeah, organization. Okay, country is location too. Yeah, and that's usually what people, There, of course, you can have more kind more classes, right? You can have a uh, different kinds of people too. Maybe you can have a person who is a politician, who is more of a comedian, other kinds of person. So it's just like a, the most basic way of classifying named entity. And token level wise, we'll have a, a one vector per token with RNNs, right? Because we know that the output of the RNNs is token level. And when we are doing text classification, yes, we were using the just last time step, but the way we're, when we're trying to do token level classification, we'll be using every token output. And then we can do the classification token level, just like uh, text classification. But then now the, the trick here is that we need to compute the loss for not each sentence, but for each token. So we're gonna actually compute the cross entropy loss for every token, and we're going to average it, just like we average across different examples. And that means that we have multiple classification problems per example, or you can think of this as a more of a, yeah, you're performing a lot of, a lot of classifications per example. And we can still use same bar directional LSTM or not. And another application we can use for the cl token classification is actually 
more of a machine reading comprehension and also called actually question answering. So here input is actually text and questions. So we have a text here. This is text. It's, it's, you can think of this document. So we have a document about some gravity and some like, not gravity actually, or like how water vap vaporize, like how does precipitation happens. And then you have a question here. Then what causes precipitation to fall? And the answer is gravity. And it's exactly similar to how you can actually do NER. The difference is that in the named entity recognition NER, what we just saw is that you were trying to just identify all possible named entities in that document. But then in question answering, you're just classifying or you're just locating the span that answers your question. And actually keep, uh, pose up, ask a question. Do we relabel the text if Barack Obama is split to subword by subword tokenizer? Yes, right. Although, I mean, relabeling, if you mean by, if humans have to do that, uh, probably not because we'll have, uh, in the ideal scenario, we will have a basically character level span of the entity. And after doing subword tokenization, we can actually trace back where those subwords correspond to. So we don't have to probably relabel with humans, but the we have to write a code that actually can, you know, relabel it. So if that's what you ask, then yes. Okay. Okay, so in that case, then the one trick here, one, one, one actually um, trick case is that Wait, we have not just one input, but we have two inputs here, right? Not just text, which was the case for the NER, but we have two inputs, text and question. So how can we handle two inputs? Well, so actually this is not an easy question that many researchers um, have kind of struggled or actually we didn't have a one best way to do this until I think quite recently, like 2017, 2018, that it's now quite common that when you have multiple inputs, then just concatenate them and then let the model handle the rest. And that's very simple. And you might think that's why people couldn't think of that, but um, yeah, it's, it's simple when you actually have done it already, but then before that, it was not obvious at all that we can just concatenate inputs. So the answer is that now I can just very surely say that just concatenate. Then, and of course you can concatenate in several ways. If you just concatenate, then maybe it's not clear where the boundary between question and the text is. So you might want to have some special token between the question document or even just the question mark. If you put question at the, at the front, it's pretty clear that the question is, you know, where it ends with at the question mark. So it's usually it's not a problem. But yeah, concatenation is usually the easiest way to approach this. And again, the expected output is a span. So this can be basically formulated as a token classification problem by classifying each token into start and end and others. Of course, you can do biotagging too, but you don't have to do biotagging. Why? Because biotagging, you need a B and I because you actually want to. You, you might have several several answers within the document, but then here we are assuming that there is one, one answer. So you only have one start and one end and all, all other things is just others. So you can classify each token into start and others. And, and because we know that there is only one start and end, actually there is a one way to make this um, better. And that is actually, we don't actually do classification token level but we can define alternatively start and end distributions. But other things are all same. Input, concatenation of question and context, and loss, yeah, average of cross entropy, or whatever probably distributions you get out of the model. And then model, is, model can be just bidirectional STM, right? Quite simple. But then what do I mean by you can define start and end distribution? Well, that what I mean by is that if you do token level three probability distribution, that means Suppose you have a three inputs and then you're gonna use LSTM. Suppose I have just four LSTM and you will have outputs here. 
And basically this output will be mapped to, well, this will be more of a, like this, right? We have a three dimensions here. Oh, it's not a good drawing. You map this into three dimensional vectors, right? This is corresponding to token level three-way probability distribution. Okay. But then alternative way, this part is corresponding to, we have a same, inputs, but then now we can do the same thing here too. But instead of computing the cross entropy, so actually I mentioned that cross entropy or softmax, you know, making this into probability distribution here, we apply softmax here, right? This is softmax. Instead of applying softmax on these logits, you apply softmax on, on this three, on, on this, all these values. And also you can apply, of course, these three values. So basically the point is that you, wh where you actually compute softmax on when what you want to make the power distribution off. So, in the black case, in the upper case, you are making probability distribution out of each token. So in, in that case, then it's possible that you will have multiple start predictions, which is not ideal, right? Because you, you just classify each token into either start and or others, then it is possible that just because model is not good enough, you will have a several prediction of start. Then how do you actually decide which start to use? Are you going to use its probability? That's fine, but then still it's kind of weird because your, how you define poly distribution actually is kind of ill-defined that you're not always yielding one start. But then if you actually do this on the um, sequence, sequence length axis, then your start distribution will be just trying to point towards just one token and same for the end. Now, of course, we don't, you don't need a distribution for others because well, everything, is, everything else is others, right? That's why we just need two. So in fact, actually, it was my bad that I drew th three circles. It should be actually just two circles. Okay. And there's a question, input length to the softmax is dynamic value. Yes, that's right. So, well, so it can be dynamic, doesn't matter because you, you, you don't really have any parameter associated with input length in this case, right? Although in the, your assignments, I um, intentionally was trying to show you that if you actually use multi-layer perceptron, then your model will be actually dependent on the input length, but RNNs will not be, dip, uh, the parameters will not be dependent on input length. So in that case, yes, it is dynamic. Okay. So hopefully that's clear. And, and um, when you're doing the um, MRC or QA later, then um, really one important advice is that you really need to um, actually, it's much better to actually define the distribution on the start and end rather than token level. That's because the model is trying to basically get, it basically trains much faster and it's more much more stable that because your distribution makes more sense, right? When you have anyways, one start and one end. And there's a really important question, actually, is LSTM good enough for long-term dependency? And um, we're, we're gonna come back to this after a five minute break until 4.45. So see you in five minutes.
Okay, welcome back. All right, so let's begin with the whether. <clears throat> Okay. Yep. So whether LSTM is well good enough for long-term dependency. So I think so far we were assuming that the model we used is always bi-directional LSTM, right? And is it good enough? So in fact, it turns out that it, it was not too bad for biotagging or more of a named entity recognition NER. Okay, there's a good question. So I might, uh, so Zhang Choi, Zhang, Choi, Zhang Choi have asked, I might have missed, but are the answers MRC tasks always spent in, in the text? The actually, no, um, they are sometimes not spent, but it is usually spent. The major reason is that it's very hard to evaluate otherwise. By enforcing them to be spent, it becomes very easy to evaluate. And also by doing so, also creating models has become easier by making them into token classification, classification model instead of generation. And text generation was not so good until like one or two years ago, I would say. I mean, in MRC domain, I would say. But then since like two years ago, it's almost um, true statement that even in the MRC, you want to formulate that as a generation task instead of a token classification, token classification task for open domain QA, not in the, uh, the MRC closed setup, though. They're still the extractive is the best. So in the NER case, this is not too bad. LSTM is pr pretty good. But then, and that's because in, in NER, first of all, dependency is not super long. And also maybe in many cases, you actually just perform NER per sentence and sentence wise, inter-sentence dependency is not, there isn't much of it. But then LSTM, when it's used for MRC, it becomes a bit more tricky because the text is very long. It can be like a few hundred words and it becomes very important to actually be aware of, uh, you know, distant words. And even though LSTM has this memory state that is able to propagate information for a long time, still that is not good enough to convey the information far enough. So that's actually where the attention comes in. And in fact, attention was actually originally proposed to handle the machine tra translation problem, which wasn't really about the long sentence, but more about the uh, bottleneck problem which we'll come back to this, I think in two lectures. I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about attention too much today, but then you can just, I want to let you know that the LSTMs, although we're assuming that we're using LSTMs to do all these um, MRC and all other text, text classification task or token classification task, I want to make sure that in fact, LSTM alone is usually not good enough. And also the power of attention actually motivated development of transformer, which has become a general purpose architecture in the modern AI. But we will come back to that later. For now, you can just think of attention as something that gives you direct access to all tokens and enabling us to basically model or enable the long-term dependency in the sentence. But for now, yeah, so we're gonna actually talk a bit about more about what is question answering and what's its relationship with respect to MRC. So in fact, so you might actually be confused a bit, if, especially if you have read some articles or papers in this domain, like MRC versus question answering. Some people actually use MRC, some people just use machine reading, some people use question answering. So first of all, MRC and machine reading is in my opinion, they are same thing, exactly same thing. They just omit C just to make it short, but um, they're exactly same thing. MRC and question answering, I think have a little different connotations. 
So, and it's more of my view. I'm not saying this is prob. It's not. It's maybe not agreed by everyone, but I think it's quite. Um, I would say, believed or I think, argued by many people. So question answering is the task of finding the answer to the question input. So what I want to say is that it's a task. The question answering is. And MRC, of course, it's a task too, but then, um, well, I mean, I want to actually, what I want to say is that the question answering focus on the application itself. So whether you do question answering correctly is whether you can actually answer que questions correctly, which is straightforward, right? I mean, of course, question answering is about answering questions. So. If your system could answer questions well, then your system is good system. And the subtle difference is that MRC focuses on the machine's ability to read and comprehend. And what it's saying is that then whether a model can do well on MRC task is to see if the model can understand well the language itself. And how we can test that is usually by asking questions. So the goal here is to actually test, test someone's intelligence or some models intelligence. And I think the difference is, in other words, you can think of this as MRC is more of a test benchmark to test whether some model is intelligent enough, just like how we use different test, you know, college entrance exams, et cetera, to test uh, someone's ability. Whereas question answering is really the searching on neighbor or Google your questions and then seeing if they can be answered. So that's why question answering technically doesn't care about what knowledge it refers to as long as the answer can be obtained. While MRC requires the model to read, an, uh, the, read the accompanying text to obtain the answer. So question answering is objective oriented and the, uh, uh, the um, MRC is method oriented. And in the community though, um, QA sometimes refers to MRC. And because QA is about you know, answering questions, you might use more of a structured data than text data to answer your questions. That's why those kind of question answering is usually called KGQA. OK? And there is a, this term called open domain question answering. So this actually term originates from assuming that question answering is equivalent to kind of machine reading comprehension. <laughs> which is given a text, you answer questions. So by putting open domain, basically we're referring to a very large set of uh, documents instead of just one. But I personally think that this is kind of misnomer because question answering by default should be open domain. It's kind of you know weird to say question answering only on the uh, um, document is the default. So I think question answering with the text data is probably a better name as opposed to, of course, I mean, not as opposed to, KGQA is something like here with structured data instead of text data. Minor point, but it could be helpful for you to actually read papers when you're reading papers, these terminologies. So let's go, get into how the ODQA works. Well, we, we saw how MRC works, right? So MRC is this part, document reader. We have a document and we have a question here. And then these two can be concatenated as inputs to go into this reader and then get the answer here. But then now the question is then, of course, we're assuming that we're given a document to answer the question. So how can we actually get the document from the beginning? Well, from a large set of corpus like Wikipedia. Well, we can use search, right? We can search in this Wikipedia to get the documents. And basically the rest of this lecture will talk about what that search is, which is maybe, which people might take as granted, but of course there is um, some algorithm into it. We're gonna actually discuss that. Today will be more about the traditional methods, which is TF-IDF based. And next lecture, we'll be talking about more about modern methods using some um, dense embedding. Okay, so the purpose of retrieval is to reduce the search space from millions of passages to a few passages so that the reader model can obtain answer by reading them in a short amount of time. So we can divide a problem into two stages, right? So 
One is that we want to map each question and passage to the same vector space. And basically we can use a model, similar model that we just discussed. We can use LSTMs, right? So that, and then we know that when we're trying to classify each sentence text classification, we will have a vector that represents the entire sentence before we perform the actual two-way or three-way classification. So we can use that model for the embedding side. And then after we obtain the, all the passage embeddings, and then also we obtain the question embedding, this has to be, of course, happen um, real time, every time the question comes in. And then when all, when all those embeddings are ready, then we just perform the search and find the passage that has the highest similarity. And of course, the question is how we define similarity is also an important question. So in a diagram, we can think of this as we embed create and pass it into same vector space and find the passage with the highest similarity. So we have a, this embedding model, two models here, and then we compute similarity and then see which model has um, the highest similarity. Of course, we'll have another passage here and another path this year, but we have only one question and we actually get what is the most similar and then get the passage. So the, the point is that the passages are mapped to vector space and, and when a question comes in, it is mapped to the same vector space and find the most similar passage. So we can visualize vector space as following. It's basically a point uh, in, of course, very high dimensional vector space. Here, you can think of this as a two dimensional for visualization. And all documents actually are somewhere in this vector space. And whenever a question comes in, we just use same, I mean, a similar model to map to this vector space. And suppose this actually maps to here, then probably most similar document is this one. Then you basically find that and then you retrieve that as output. Okay, clear. So then question is then what kind of, how can we map each text into vector space? And of course we can use LSTMs. We're gonna talk about next um, lecture, but we're gonna come back to more traditional methods which are still used very popularly and also very effective in some cases, which is called um, bag of words. And what is bag of words? Well. It is called bag of words because you do not consider how the words are organized. You have these all these words in the text and they are very organized. And by organization, they carry meaning, they carry syntax, they carry sem semantics. But then we ignore that and we just basically, you know, just put those words into one bag, just like this bag and doesn't have any order. It just have uh, the sense of containment, whether a word exists in this text or not. And then what we do is then, it's very similar to, if you remember how we actually built the one hot vector from the um, input words for the word embeddings, but a bit different here is that we're not actually no more, we're not one hot vector anymore. We're actually multi hot vector. And we basically want to indicate which words are in the uh, sentence out of all possible words. So this is of course vocab space. And then we just mark one if this sentence or this document has that word and we mark it zero if it doesn't have. So in this case, then of course, the first document doesn't have the word worst. So that's why it's zero. And the second document doesn't have best, so it's zero here. Then we can now we now just represented each document with a vector, right? A real real value vector. That's great. And all we just show you is just basically unigram bag of words, which means that the unit of each vocabulary is single word. 
but then we don't have to actually use just one word as the unit of the vocabulary. It's also possible that we can use up to two words for the vocab. In that case, for instance, if the sentence is, it was the best of times, then we can have a biograms, which means two word, I mean, two token words. Then basically we have a, it was because here, right? And was the here and the best is here and best of and of time. So in that case, then now we have how many? Five bigrams, one, two, three, four, five. And we had six unigrams. Then we can combine these two into our vocab, right? And of course we can just make this arbitrarily a lot. I mean, we can just continue on increasing the length of the, the, the unit of the vocab. And if we increase that to N, then we call it N gram bag of words. And after we have done that, then we can, how can we measure similarity? Oftentimes we use cosine similarity. So if you remember what cosine similarity is, then basically you normalize each vector so that its norm become one. And then you do the inner product, which is basically element wise multiplication and then summation. So what does that mean? Then if you do the cosine similarity of two bag of word vectors, then they will have element wise non-zero if and only if they have common words. Do you get this? Well, because suppose, forget about the normalization for now because normalization just actually scales it. If you actually multiply these two vectors, then you will have one times one, which is one, one times one is one, one, but one times zero will be zero. Zero times one will be zero. So you get what I mean by both documents have to have the same word in it to have non-zero element-wise, the dimension-wise multiplication or the inner product. So in other words, the inner product of two document vectors will be high if and only if they have a lot of overlapping words, which is why bag of words is very effective if you want to find documents that have similar words. I mean, I mean, same words, many same, same words. But of course, doesn't mean that they can account for words that are different but have similar meanings. But that's actually one issue. But another actually issue I want to talk about first is that when we're using n-gram bag of words, if n is too large, then we'll have a very large vocab because there are so many possible combination of words. So in big O terms, the vocab size will be basically big O of V, I mean the vocab size of a resulting n-gram, of course. So I'll denote this with n, unigram vocab, to the power of n. And vocab size of unigram can be as big as something like 100,000. And if n is like five, then you're talking about 100,000 to the power of five, which is very large. So we'll have very large vocab if n is too large. So, and then that means that embedding will be very sparse. And we just talk about what, how the cosine similarity works. They will have non-zero values only if they're, they have same words in the same, in, the, in that dimension. So. This means that if n is too large, then embedding will be very sparse, which means that inner product will be zero for most dimensions. That means it can be very useless. So n cannot be too large. And in general, you don't want to actually go up to like four or five, unless you're talking about like Google scale data. Usually like trigram is usually the, um, probably the upper limits for most data, I think. And another limitation of bag of words is that the, it gives the same weight to every word. But we just saw that here. Actually, we don't want to make these two documents same because the, the really the difference between these two documents is the adjective, or I'm actually the noun best and worst, right? And we want to make sure that we want to recognize the difference between the, these two documents by actually paying more attention to the word best and worst. But because of these overlapping words, like it was the and of times, which are semantically very, very little information value, 
but then we still have their matching, we're just gonna have a very high cosine similarity, which is not desired, right? So that's why bag of words is limited. And we want to actually make bag of words a bit more improved. So technically TF-IDF is actually a subclass of bag of words. And we want to have a different weights for different words, depending on how much information those words carry. We don't really care about common words like is or on when matching, right? And named entities like Barack Obama or best or worst should have more values. So then the motivation behind the invention of tf -IDF is basically we want to give more weights to more important words. Simple, right? So um, how do we compute tf -IDF? Well, so tf -IDF is basically the multiplication of TF and IDF scores. That's why it's called tf -IDF. TF is term frequency. So it's the raw count of the term T in the document D divided by the number of words in the document. So basically it's just a, a number between zero and one, right? Because we are dividing the count of a certain term divided by the, the count of every words. And it will be basically high if they're high occurrence. So if we have like say 500 words document and the, the word is appears like hundred times, then the, the this TF will be 0 0.2, right? Because hundred divided by 500. So it's a TFI is just the value between zero and one. <clears throat> And we want to define df, which is the really important thing. If we just if we just use tf, then it's just similar to back of words, right? But then df is really the where the difference comes in, because we want to compute the raw count of how many documents in our corpus or our set of documents that have the term t, and we basically want to penalize the term that has high df, because what that means is then that word anyways occurs you know, in almost every document. For instance, let's say DF was same as the number of documents N, then probably the, 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 the fact that the word occurs in the document is useless because anyway, it has, it's occurring in every document, right? So that's why we want to actually penalize having high DF by uh, defining IDF as N over DF, and then taking a log. We take log because this DF is usually very, sometimes very small, something like you know, 10 or 100. And still we, want, we don't want to you know, make this too large value. That's why um, suppose that N was you know, um, 10 million and DF was 10, then this will be just um, 1 million, right? And then if you take log of 1 million, if log base is 10, then it becomes just uh, six. Of course, usually we don't take um, base 10 log, we usually take natural log, but still you get the point, right? So that's the point of having this log, but then other things are quite straightforward. We're just trying to penalize if you have high DF. <clears throat> so what happens, if, what happens if DF is uh, equal to N, then N over N is one, so log of one is zero. So then in that case, then IDF value of a term that occurs at every document, is zero, so your TF IDF will be zero, meaning that even if that term occurs so many times in the documents, you will just give zero weight to it. This will be probably the case for words like is, the, they will have zero weights anyway. And there are a few in, you know, interesting characteristics. So one of them is that they, of course, they will have high weights on rare words. So if it only happens like 10 times in the 10 million documents, then your IDF value will be basic base 10 log six, right? In that case, then these terms will have really high weights, whereas the nearly zero weight on common words. So it's very effective for searching named entities. And also another really important characteristic is that the sparsity allows us to build a very efficient search index and it's called invert index. So what do I mean by that? So we actually, you're gonna do this for your actually um, your assignment number two. So what I mean by is that suppose because of the sparsity, you can actually track how many documents have the term Barak. Then you can have a dictionary 
that has a key barrack and you have a document IDs like 0, 15, 10, 1,000, and maybe um, 15,001, uh, 15, and et cetera. And suppose this is very small compared to the size of the entire document. Then whenever a question comes in, you know that your question has the word barrack, then that means you only have to search through this list because, I mean, not just list list, but then just concatenation of all the list that has the words in the question because your value will be all, only non-zero for those documents that contain these, these important words in the query. That's why you can actually search really efficiently and that's called inverted index and you'll be asked to implement that in your assignment. And in practice, actually, a slight modification of TF-IDF called BM25 is more often used in um, everyday life. In fact, many search engines still, like including probably, I think, large portion of like, uh, you know, for instance, neighbor is very dependent on PM25. And you might think it's much more complex than TF-IDF, but then in fact, I can tell you that it's not so much, I would say, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually not too, too different. So basically if you were to compute the score, uh, in the um, the similar equation of just uh, vanilla TFIDF, this will be just same here, IDF. But then what you multiply here is that instead you multiply TF over term and D. So basically what BM25 does is they're replacing this TF part with this. And how does this, did this differ from the just the vanilla TF. Well, if you look at the TF, the TF IDF times K1 plus one, TF IDF is also just TF times IDF, right? So you can, if you actually just, you can just basically cancel out this TF if you are just trying to compare these two. So basically just the um, T, uh, BM25 is just multiplying this IDF times K plus one over this TFIDF plus K1 blah, blah in the denominator to the vanilla TFIDF equation. And um, then why, why, what's happening here? Well, um, these values, like, you know, this, like uh, all these weird values, um, I, I cannot say they're super scientific. It's more of a, a lot of um, intuition and also experimental uh, hyperparameter tuning has gone, gone in, but people, Everyone agrees that it's pretty effective. So um, it's good to know. Although we're not gonna cover BM25 in our um, assignments or future lectures. And just like big up words, matching only happens when the passage and the question share a term. And that's why we can actually create inverted index actually, because we don't have to care about the words that don't match. But of course, the, the biggest <clears throat> drawback is that you can't handle similar but different words like good and best, they will be located in different dimensions of the bag of words. So that's why they cannot be compared at all. And the model will not be able to know they are similar at all. So that's actually motivating us why we need something better than the bag of word or bag of word var variants like TFIDF and BM25 because we cannot handle these kind of things. And that's what we're gonna cover in the next lecture. Okay, so that's it. I'm not sure why I have two documents I and mean, two slides for this. It's, um, you know, I think a mistake, but that's, that's good. I think I just made it in time. I'm going to have a short poll, whether everyone's good with the pace. One minute, Paul, please. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna launch the polls, please.
this poll will be very um, useful for me to paste the class, how much I, how much time I actually put into the um, recapping, et cetera. Okay, so the question is, are we going to implement TFIDF for text classification? Yes, but then not for, I'm not, you want to implement TFIDF, but not for text classification because TFIDF is not for text classification, it's for retrieval. Would you say that similar weighting schemes might be implicitly true for NM-based embeddings as well? Is it, would the magnitude of the embedding vector for is be small? Um, well, so in the NM-based, you don't actually create an embedding per word, you create embedding per sentence. So you cannot know what the uh, is embedding will be, but if you just consider a sentence with just word is, then probably yes, but it's not really about magnitude in that case. Oh yeah, actually it could be about the magnitude too, yeah. But then I think your um, question is a bit, um, I would say asking a different thing. And what I'm saying is that, you know, um, here it was possible to compare between words because we're actually explicitly using each dimension for each word, but then in embedding base, each dimension doesn't correspond to each word. It's a very, um, each dimension is actually an abstract characteristic of the text. And the next question was, does TFIDF give high ways to typos? Yes, it will. I mean, but then it, it depends. You're right, I, I see where you're getting. But then if typos didn't happen at all in the document corpus, and then if you're, you're in your question, it had a typo, then it will be out of vocab, right? Because you have never seen it. In that case, then it's not about having high weights. It's actually, you cannot actually assign a weight at all because you haven't seen that word during training time or creating your TFIDF index. So depends on what kind of typo you're talking about. If it's not never seen, then out of vocab. So it's going to be ignored. Okay, thank you for your, um, participation. So I'm going to just share it briefly. So it looks like I think about half people having no trouble at all. And I think the, about the other half is some issues, but fine, but there are also some people who are having trouble. So, okay. I think um, it's pretty help, very helpful for me to actually paste the class. All right. So Yep, thanks a lot. So I'm going to see you on Wednesday. Because there was one more question. Is a score for BIM25, should the term TFIDF term be TF term D? Um, as far as I know, uh, yes, I don't exactly know the equation. Let me take a look. I just copied this from, I think, Wikipedia. It might be true, yeah. Um, trying to take a look, maybe it's TF. You're right, actually, yeah. So this actually should be TF. That's a really good point. Looks like you're a pretty expert in this PM25. <laughs> yeah, I think this should be TF. Not the entire TF IDF. Thanks for pointing out. So I'll actually make this fix um, next lecture. Okay, thanks a lot.